This is the Comics Alternative, episode 206, a look at the 2016 Ignatz Awards. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics. And on this week's episode, Gwen and I are going to be discussing the 2016 Ignatz Award nominations. But before we get into that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse comics at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Now, sometimes those specials will be at 45% off of the cover price, sometimes as much as 50% off the cover. But you know, Gwen, every now and again, you can find discounts that are quite a bit more impressive than that. That's right, Derek. And, you know, for this show, I looked up a couple of the titles that we're going to talk about today that are on a deep discount at Discount Comic Book Service. One of them is Nick Drasno's Beverly, which I know we both have really enjoyed over the last year. Mm -hmm. That you can get for $15.37, which is 30% off of the cover price. And the wonderful Kate Beaton, who every cool person loves, (laughs) um, her Step Aside Pops is available for $30. $13.97, $13.97, which again is 30% off. And, and looking through, a lot of the other titles too are available, and again, at that kind of really deep discount. So our, our, our listeners should just head on over to DCBS. That's right. They have great discounts on Ignatz nominee books and others. Check out their website, dcbservice.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Gwen and Derek sent you. That's right. Hey, Derek, I understand you had a really great time last weekend at SPX. Yes, I did. And in fact, uh, this week's episodes, and who knows, maybe into early next week, is, is uh, those episodes are going to reflect my time at Small Press Expo in Bethesda over the weekend. Um I went last year for the first time, so this was my second year. I knew a little bit more about what to expect. And this year, one of the things that really helped is that I stayed at the convention hotel, the Marriott there. So anytime I felt overburdened by the number of books I had with me, you know, buying them, getting them signed, I just ran up to my room, dropped them off, and came back downstairs. That's great. It sounds like it was really an amazing time. How many exhibitors were there? You know, I don't know the numbers, but it uh, it, it was packed, uh, yeah. both in terms of the exhibitors and also in terms of the, the audience, especially Saturday. That was by far uh, the busier of the two days. Now, our friend Andy Wolverton was able to make it, and, and that was good. He came up for part of the day on Saturday. I was able to see him for a while. Um, he came early or at least before the floor opened on Saturday which was at 11 a.m. and he and I talked for about an hour and a half before that time and then once the doors opened we kind of lost track of each other he stayed for two maybe three hours and then had to go back home but but it was really great seeing Andy at the con yeah I know I really want to try and go next year maybe we can do a an entire show of young readers stuff when I'm there so that would be fun Oh, I think that'd be great. Yeah. You know, um, another person that I met for the first time, at least in person, uh, because I've corresponded with him uh, virtually through email and on Twitter, is a longtime listener of the show, and that is Pascal Hammond. Uh, in fact, Andy Wolverton and I were talking before the doors opened on Saturday, and this guy came up and said, uh, hi, uh, you Derek and Andy from the Comics Alternative? And we said, yes. And he introduced himself as Pascal Hammond, and I immediately recognized the name. So it, it, it's always good to meet your listeners. It's one thing to correspond with them 
in, in, in one way or another on social media or via email, but it, it makes a big difference when you see them in person because you realize, hey, we really do reach people out there. They yeah. listen to this show. So it was great meeting him, and even more significantly, Pascal and I had a great time hanging out on Saturday evening. We went to a great restaurant. We spent the rest of the time talking about comics and, and, and just a variety of different things. So that was really good hanging out with him. It was one of the highlights of the weekend for me. Oh, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Hey, listen, I do have another question. Did you meet any young reader folks? I, I, I know Andy, I think, had a chance to interview some folks for a future um, podcast, but did you have that chance too? Yes, I did. And uh, one of the things that you and our listeners will find over the next several days is a variety of shorter interviews that I and Andy Wolverton did while we were at SPX. Now, yesterday, Tuesday, my interview with Carol Tyler – uh, that I did at SPX, uh, went up on the podcast, so uh, people can listen to that. But beginning tomorrow, on Thursday, uh, there's going to be, I think, a series of three interview shows that will have like short five to ten minute interviews with a variety of different creators that both Wolverton and I talked with at the con. And I know Andy talked with several who were authors of Young Reader books, and, and I talked with some as well. So, right. Uh, so it, it will be over the next week, uh, Small Press Expo Fest on the Comics Alternative. That's great. And speaking of young readers, I have to tell you, Derek, that while you were at SPX, I was catching up on a lot of the titles that we're going to talk about today for the nominees. And it was a really interesting experience. I'd read probably about 30% of the list before um, actually accessing the nominees. <clears throat> and so I went through and I pretty much power read over the weekend. And I came away with this really deeper understanding of I guess for a better lack of a better word, the millennial generation. There's a lot of 20-something and young 30-something comics creators represented on this list. Was that your impression, too, of, of the folks who were at the, at the con? Oh, definitely. Uh, one of the things that struck me this year as well as last year is the age of the attendees. Uh, not, not only the people who were there uh, as exhibiting, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I think more significantly the people who were uh, at the event themselves. Uh, and also these are the people who were voting for the Ignance nominees. And in fact, that's a great segue into us delving into the actual nominees for this year's Ignatz Awards. Do I get a Do I get a great segue award for that? Yes, you do. You get All a right. golden segue award. <laughs> well, you know, for our listeners, Gwen and I um, thought that what we would do is to talk about the nominees in kind of a free-flowing way. In other words, we're not going to go category by category and to discuss every single nominee within that category. That's a little too too organized, too pat, and, and, and we're beyond organized on the comics alternative. <laughs> uh, but we do want to make connections between and among the various categories because you will find a number of double nominations uh, for certain texts. But one of the things we should do, though, Gwen, is to go through quickly the list of nominees for this year's Ignatz Awards. Um in the Outstanding Artist category, we had nominated Daniel Klaus's Patience, Ryan Heschke's Mean Girls Club, Kevin Huingas's Ganges, or the latest issue of Ganges, Noah Van Skyver's Disquiet, and Tilly Walden's The End of Summer. In the Outstanding Anthology or Collection category, there is Nick Drasso's Beverly, Beyond, the queer sci-fi and fantasy anthology edited by Sfrey R. Monster and Tanika Stotz. The Complete Women's Comics, edited by Trina Robbins. Killing and Dying by Adrian Tomini. And Step Aside Pops by Kate <laughs> Beaton. Great title. It is. After that, there's the Outstanding Graphic Novel. And those nominees are The Hot Dog Taste Test by Lisa Hannawalt. Not Away by Joshua Cotter. Sick by Gabby Schultz, 
Soldier's Heart, Carol Tyler, and Trashed by Durf Backdurf. For the Outstanding Story category, there is Joe Sparrow's The Hunter, Adrian Tomini's Killing and Dying, Simon Hanselman's Meg and Mog in Amsterdam, Noah Van Skyver's My Hot Date, and Kim Deitch's Shrine of the Monkey God from Kramer's Ergo No. 9. Then for our Promising New Talent category, there is Kevin Budnick with Handbook, Maya Kobabi with Tom O'Bedlam, Sarah Lotman with The Ultimate Laugh and Grape Nuts, Carolyn Nowak with Radishes, and Tilly Walden, I Love This Part. For the Outstanding Series, there is Cartosa Tales, edited by Isaac Cates, Demon by Jason Shiga, Ganges, Kevin Huinziga, Meg Moog Mog and Owl, Simon Hasselman, and Powdered Milk by Kyler Roberts. For the Outstanding Comic category, there is As the Crow Flies by Melanie Gilman, Be Good by John Martz, Fantasy Sports No. 1 by Samp Bosma, Patience, Dan Klaus, and Shrine of the Monkey God by Kim Deitch. For their outstanding mini-comic category, the nominees are The Experts by Sophie Franz, Laffy Meal by Pranus, and I'm, I keep butchering this name, Noyukaitis, so Pranus Noyukaitis, yeah. Maps to the Suns by Sloan Leong, Radishes, Carolyn Nowak, and The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest by Luke Healy. And then finally, there's the Outstanding Online Comic Category, and those nominees are A Cartoonist Diary by Rina Young, and again, I hope I'm pronouncing that name at least somewhat correctly, Just Doing My Job by Glennis Fox, Octopus Pie by Meredith Gran, A Small Revolution by Samantha Lerich Guione, and Vatu by Evan Dom. So there are our nominees for the 2016 Ignatz Awards. Yeah, it's a really great list of comics. Yeah. Now, Gwen, you know, we should mention that the Ignatz Awards were giving out this past Saturday night, so it's not as if, you know, we're waiting for the winners. We do know the winners. And even though we can discuss who won, I think that you and I are much more interested in this entire list, right? So we're not going to focus specifically on the winners of each of these categories, but on as many nominees as we can get to. Now, we should mention uh, also at the outset that you and I may not be discussing every single one of these books, One, I mean, there are a lot of books here, as our listeners just heard. Uh, So we'll get to as many as we can. Some will go into more detail than others. But also, you and I were limited in terms of what we could get a hold of. You know, you mentioned earlier that you and I have discussed some of these books on previous podcasts, uh, and uh, we we may have already had these. But a variety of these books we got over the past month or so in either hard copy or digital format. So what we're discussing are the books that we know we have and we were able to get. There were some, for example, the Beyond Anthology that we were not able to get our hands on. And if we weren't able to get it, if the publishers or the authors were unable to send us copies in any way, then unfortunately – we couldn't discuss it, right, because we didn't know the book. So if you're one of those authors whose books we are not discussing in any kind of detail whatsoever, we apologize. It's just that we didn't have your text to present for the show. Right. You know, Andy, there's a place to – Andy, I'm so used to talking <laughs> you're used to, to talking sorry, to Wolverton. Dear. You know, Andy, <laughs> that's my typical golden segue. Um, I actually would love to talk a little bit, not so much just about the outstanding category as a category, but really about the importance of story in comics. And I – this to me was an amazing category just because um, all of the stories that we were able to get a hold of, and I think we got a hold of four of the five stories, were really intense mm-hmm. and in some ways somewhat different and therefore 
somewhat representative, I think, of the scope of comics that were part of this year's award categories. Um, and the, the the one that we talked a little bit about off mic yesterday was The Shrine of the Monkey God um, by Kim Deitch. And I, that is the comic that has stuck with me both in terms of the story and the visuals from my big binge reading this weekend. Um, do you want to tell the, the listeners a little bit about the story for that comic? Because I know it's one of your favorites. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the visuals. So, Right. Uh, and, you know, you, you've hit upon one of the stories that resonates most with me of this entire uh, year's nominees, and that is Kim Deitch's work, uh, Shrine of the Monkey God. And to me, this is what I would consider typical Tim Deitch in that it's all about storytelling. So it's appropriate that Shrine of the Monkey God was nominated for the outstanding story because this comic is all about story. It begins in New York's Museum of Natural History where Kim and his wife Pam are looking around and they go up to one of these dioramas that have uh, various primates mm-hmm. and they're and they're talking about this and you know what it looks like, what kind of uh, feel it has. And then Kim remember because Kim as a character in this comic, and, and many times he is a character in his own comic, although mm-hmm. he doesn't write autobiographical comics. Uh, I mean, there may be some of his own life that is embedded in his comics, but I certainly wouldn't call him an autobiographical uh, comics author. But nonetheless, he's a character in many of his comics. And so he and his wife are talking about the diorama, And then that reminds him of a story, something that happened to him as a kid when he was at the same museum looking at the same exhibit. And so he tells Pam this story, and the story he tells is of, as a kid looking at this diorama, a guy comes up and starts talking to him. And this man starts to tell the young Kim Deitch a story about his experiences with this diorama. And then this guy's story branches off into one and then at least a, a second other story level. Um, now, it to me, it's typical Kim Deitch in that it's story within a story within a story. Mm-hmm. Whenever I read Kim's work – I have to stop every now and again to realize where I am on the narrative level because it's easy to get lost where one story builds upon and expands into another very fluidly. Um, And in almost all of these kind of comics that he does, you go up or down depending on how you look at narrative levels um, Mm -hmm. from one level to the other and then as the story dissipates, you go back down. And we have the same thing going on here with Shrine of the Monkey God. Yeah, I'm actually going to use this um, short comic now with my students this semester because I'm trying to, in addition to the longer form comics that they're reading, I'm trying to show them shorter comics that illustrate a particular comics principle well. And point of view and narration mm-hmm. um, is really a good um, a good thing to look at with this comic. For me... It's not, though, just the story that moved me. It's the it's Deitch's line style, mm. which is just really well set up to, to show emotion. And the two prominent emotions to me in, in this comic are despair um, and love. And both of them come across so well with his line style. And so for me, it's not just a great story. It's not just a really lovely use of the comics medium for storytelling. But it's also the way that Deitch draws characters, especially their faces and their emotions, that just the the sort of um, heavy lines, the, the shading that he uses, just it really evokes... Also, I just have a soft spot for animals. Um, you know, Derek, when I was a kid, I had asthma. And um, one of our librarians suggested that I read a biography of Theodore Roosevelt, who had asthma as well as a boy. And I will admit that was really a, a inspirational read in some ways because, you know, if he could beat it, so can I. But actually, most of the biography, the first one that I read, was about all of the animals that he that his parents brought him to to practice taxidermy with. 
And apparently for his entire life, Theodore Roosevelt was obsessed with collecting game and then doing taxidermy and then hanging them up. If you've ever been to his house in Sagamore Hill, um, that's a major feature of the house are all the stuffed animals, Mm -hmm. (laughs) literally. And as a kid, even, I was a little creeped out by that. It's like, oh, yay, (laughs) great for the, like, asthma inspiration, but not so great for just going out and, you know, killing tons of animals. And this story also sort of touched me in that way because it does deal with the disruption of sort of natural relationships um, via um, sort of incursion and also just how absolutely sometimes barren human relationships are versus the relationships that people have with, with animals. And I, so I, I loved the story on so many levels. Oh yeah. You know, another thing that has this Kim Deitch stamp for me is that it deals with this negotiation between past and present. And many times that past is embedded in childhood. And so we have here, uh, you know, Kim Deitch is, as a character in the story, his own childhood, right? Because his first story level was when he tells his wife, Pam, about an experience he had at the museum when he was young. Uh, but then the guy who ends up telling him the story when he was young uh, about his relationship with these primates also talks about when he was young. And, and you'll find this in a lot of Kim Deitch's stories, such as uh, The Boulevard of Broken Dreams, The Search for Smiling Ed, Alias the Cat – where characters go back in time, at least in their mind or with their stories. And many times this trip back or this memory has a lot to do with popular culture in some form or another. Although pop culture really doesn't figure much into Shrine of the Monkey God here. Uh, but nonetheless, there is this kind of going back. And so with, with, with Deitch's work or in Deitch's work, we get not only an emphasis on storytelling, but storytelling as a way of – Framing the self uh-huh. within the the present self, especially within the context of the past self. Yeah, and you know anybody who's reading the category of outstanding story will also find Joe Sparrow's The Hunter, which is another comic that deals with the, the sort of obsession, um, but basically with obsession, but the same in some ways the same kind of obsession, the obsession to kill, collect animals, and stuff them, and then killing and dying, um, which has as its first story, you know, um, a guy who's absolutely becomes obsessed with this particular form of culture that he's come up with. So there's a lot of obsession going on in this category and in the stories in general. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you drew the connection between Shrine of the Monkey God and uh, Joe Sparrow's The Hunter. Um, I, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. I mean, The Hunter is all about killing, mounting, and acquisition, right? Uh, right. And, and then and does this character in the story learn by the time we get to the end of this relatively short story. Um, Now, it's interesting also that you brought up Tomaini's Killing and Dying because, you know, this was nominated a couple of times. It was in, what is it? The Oh, yeah, it's in multiple. uh, It's, yeah, the Outstanding Anthology or Collection category, but also an Outstanding Story. Now, this is what was a little unclear to me. Killing and Dying is a story within the collection Killing and Dying. So my assumption was that for the Outstanding Story category, it's that story Killing and Dying. Although when they wrote out this nomination, Killing and Dying was not included in quotes. So it's a little unclear. They mean the entire book, which wouldn't make sense for that for Outstanding Story. Or is it just the story Killing and Dying in this book? I don't know. I think the latter makes more sense. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of it more holistically. Mm-hmm. I guess that's what I did in my mind was I just, okay, the holes. And, and they are sort of connected, the stories, to be fair. Because, they are. Because, you know, all of them deal with, with, among other things, sort of marital relationships and mm-hmm. obsession. Um, but, but, yeah, it is interesting to think about sort of many of the stories in this, uh, in this category deal with people who have a single-minded passion of one kind or another. And... That's fascinating in and of itself. Yeah. Also, I mean, we're not even mentioning My Hot Date, which, which won was this the, category. Exactly. That was the winner. And it does have a lot to do with what you just mentioned, obsession. Mm-hmm. And, and also, I think the the setting for that story, like some of the other stories in this category, um, it's really trying to depict a particular time and place. 
And in this case, it's 1998. So for any of you who were part of the post-grunge generation, this is the story for you because it just dips you into that milieu. And, you know, it's just I, I it was an amazing story in a lot of ways. But but again, about a young young man who's trying to find himself and uh, and does it in some <laughs> kind of misguided ways, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a great story, yo. Yeah. Yeah, there's a yeah, it's basically, you know, the <laughs> the the sort of impoverished white boy culture of talking hip hop and it 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 falls it doesn't fall flat in the storyline of the comic, no. but for the characters it falls pretty flat. So. Exactly. There's a lot of yoing. And when we discussed this last year on an episode of the review show, you know, we pointed that out. Now, one of the things that I found interesting about My Hot Date winning the Outstanding Story category, and, and maybe Gwen, you can um, feel the same way, is that this was an autobiographical story from Noah, but Noah Van Skyver doesn't only write autobiographical comics. And in fact, I wouldn't even consider him primarily an autobiographical comics artist. And he was nominated in another category, the book Disquiet in the Outstanding Artist. Mm -hmm. Now, that did not win. Uh, the winner of that category was Tilly Walden's The End of Summer. But I found it curious that it was My Hot Date that won in this category, Outstanding Story, because a lot of winners – of the Ignance, and not just this year, but in past years as well, tend to be more, or at least the nominees especially, tend to be on the more, let's say, memoir, autobiographical side mm -hmm. of things. Yeah, well, that certainly is the case here. I'm thinking of a lot of the other winners, even this time, Powdered Milk by Kyla Roberts, um, Octopus Pie by Meredith Grand. Both of those are, you know, very autobiographical texts, My yeah. Hot Date. So yeah, it's definitely a... Uh, it seems like a trend here. Right. You know? So Powdered Milk by Kyla Roberts won for the Outstanding Series category and then Octopus Pie for the Outstanding Online Comic. Now, you know, it's funny. I, I, I talked briefly with Meredith Grand, not for the podcast, but almost in passing. And this was Saturday before the awards. And so um, I, I didn't interview her. I didn't go into detail in my conversation with her because at the time I hadn't read much of Octopus Pie. And I, I'm much more familiar with it now over the past few days. But were you familiar with Octopus Pie before we began preparing for this episode? All that I knew about it was I have a current student who does a webcomic herself, and she had given me um, a couple um, a couple recommendations, although actually that wasn't one of them. So I'm trying – someone recommended this to me. Mm. Um, maybe it was when I was at Quimby's in Chicago because a lot of times I'll talk to – they're so knowledgeable there, mm -hmm. the clerks, about what's going on because I'm very interested in sort of the small comic scene as well, especially for women comics creators. Oftentimes, web comics are the in, uh, sort of the entree for them into, um, into getting a publishing deal eventually. Someone had mentioned it to me, and maybe I'd read a strip, but I actually sat down and did a concentrated reading of it. Um, and I have to say that it reminds me so much of – I'm Facebook friends with a lot of my former students who have moved to New York City. Mm -hmm. Many of them are living in Brooklyn or in Queens. And they will often, you know, put their exploits on, on Facebook or they'll get in touch with me and tell me what's going on with them. And this felt to me so much like their life. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's most of the, the storylines are dealing with, you know, people who have college degrees can't find work or doing part-time jobs. The relationships that they're having with other people are those sort of first exploratory relationships that young people have with each other. So, you know, I actually um, enjoyed reading it, but it reminded me a lot of some of the other um, nominees, even the first part of Powdered Milk mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first few chapters of that. And then My Hot Date. I mean, there's a lot of these texts that deal with that sort of either teens or young people and coming of age issues. So Right. You know, now now 
sticking with the outstanding online comic category, uh, something you said was that um, online comics especially are useful to young female creators who are just getting started and maybe getting their sea leg, so to speak, when it comes to their craft. Uh, I, I think web comics in, in general is is a great way for artists to explore a particular topic in their voice and what have you. But it's interesting that of the five nominees, four of them are women. Uh, the male, Evan Dom, was nominated for Vatu. Which is one of your favorite comics, I know. It, exactly. And I, I love Vatu. It's one of the first ones we discussed on our webcomic series about a year and a half ago. And I was really pulling for that. But, you know. Um, I really like Octopus Pie as well. It uh, very much deserved that. Now, another observation that I have for the out Outstanding Online Comic category is that of the five nominees, only two of them are longer ongoing and currently ongoing web comics. Uh, the one I was surprised that of these nominees, three of them are not only finished completed web comics, but relatively short. Uh, for example, uh, Ayu Young, and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that name correctly, Rena Ayuyang, A-Y-U-Y-A-N-G. A cartoonist diary only had, I think, about five installments. I know. I kept looking for more. I thought there has to be more. It, yeah, it, it, it had that feel that there was supposed to be more. Uh, and then Glennis Fox's Just Doing My Job was, uh, I would say, a short story webcomic, right? I mean, she right. she does other things, but it's in a short story form. And then A Small Revolution is – a little longer than those other two, but it's still relatively short, right? It's and something that I thought could have been explored even fully. More well, fully. the thing about that comic, too, is I think it's it's an – I'm not sure if I'm correct here, but it was originally published in French, and I don't know if it was actually published in paper form or not, but this is the translated form of a mm -hmm. comic that already existed. Mm -hmm. right. So that was interesting, too, whereas like with Octopus Pie, when I opened up the first – installment i think she calls the first couple chapters introduction and i looked down in the comments because that's one thing about web comics um or sorry online comics that i really like so much is sort of seeing responses as i'm reading the comics and this one young woman had written in and said well i just meant to click on one and then i spent three hours <laughs> reading your comic and if i had re i didn't read all of it i i moved through and read probably about 15 chapters mm -hmm. but i could have spent an entire day reading it so there's a lot there with octopus pie so if you start reading it there's a lot that you'll have to read after but yeah that's true yeah now you know you mentioned reading the comments to the web comics more times than not i tend not to read the comments uh at least when i read the web comics for our online or i'm sorry for our monthly web comics episode right um and, and one of the reasons for that is that many times it'll distract me it'll take me away from the story uh, and this is something that Sean and I have discussed a number of times is how the comment section can potentially detract and even sidetrack uh, a particular webcomic. So, for instance, I mean, we've seen examples where um, a creator tends to take comments from people who you know read the webcomic and they make a comment about a particular installment, and, and they'll do something with it. Um, sometimes they will change their comic – Maybe for the better, uh, someone will observe, oh, you made a mistake here on this particular page, and they'll go back and fix it. Um, but many times they will say, oh, well, a creator will write, I'm glad that you like that. Just wait to what's coming up next week. And and that's approaching spoiler territory for me. So I, yeah. Yeah, to me, I, as a reader, I just prefer we, when the creator is not making those kind of comments and engaging with his or her audience – even though I see the benefit of responding to and communicating with those who are reading the webcomic. And that brings me to Evan Dom's Vatu. One of the things that defines his kind of webcomics on his site, and this is not just Vatu, but Rice Boy, and then the shorter webcomics he has up, is that he does not offer a comment uh, function on his webcomics. And his site is very minimal, stripped down. You just get the webcomic, and that's that. Right. 
Well, you know, actually, the reason why I mentioned that in the first place is one of the research strands that I'm working on is participatory online communities that young people are part of. So this gets Mm -hmm. back to sort of my interest in the way that authors and and young people interact with each other online. So that was really more my interest. I read a lot of comics for children that that start online. Like if you read sort of early Raina Telgemeier comics, um, you'll see her really engaging young people in discussion. And that's the sort of thing I meant more than, than anything. But yeah, Octopus Pie, I will say, not only has a comic sec- comment section, but I think a lot of the readers of that com- comic end up talking to each other. So you're right. If you got into that, that would be a, a whole nother, well, it would be interesting for a sociologist, but probably not if you're just interested in the story. Right. And I'm glad that you made that observation that this is something that you find with a lot of younger readers, right? It's a place, mm-hmm. these web comics in many ways uh, are a place for them to correspond, not only with the creators, but also with each other and to create communities. And so that has me wondering if Dom's lack of that option may work against him with certain readers. It also leads us to something that we've teased or touched upon one or two times already, and that is the general audience for the kind of books that seem to be winning for the Ignatz Awards. Now, you were asking me earlier about, you know, the demographics of the attendees and also the exhibitors. And I mentioned that, you know, a lot of young people. It's something that I've noticed the two years that I've gone. And I'm wondering if the winners of the Ignatz Awards, and and by the way, they're voted on by those in attendance, right? So a panel of judges nominates uh, the various text, uh, the various creators, but then those who are at Small Press Expo on Saturday uh, fill out a form and drop it in a box, and that's how the winners are selected. So if most of those in attendance are younger and you know <laughs> significantly younger than than you and, and I am are, then um, you know that goes a long way to determining. What we could call arguably a Ignatz Award kind of book. In fact, do you think it's even fair to talk about a kind of comic that has that Ignatz Award feel or stamp to it? I do, actually, because interestingly, a number of the comics that I had read before admittedly were more mainstream um, and had gotten a lot of mainstream press. And when I look at the categories, it's pretty clear that those comics really didn't win at all. And so I think that there's definitely a predisposition among attendees for more um, truly independent comics and maybe comics that deal with subject matter that's more relevant to that age group, although I don't want to really obviously want want to make generalizations, but at least vast ones. I might make many generalizations. But yeah, there's definitely, I think, a a nod in this towards the experience of younger people. I mean, I'm thinking about the category um, uh, Outstanding Story, which we were talking about before. I really loved the story by Noah Van Scriver about my hot date, but it's, it's definitely sort of almost it feels like a one shot. It definitely deals with one episode um, early in his life. It's beautifully rendered, but I would say that in terms of subject matter, it's it's pretty focused, mm-hmm. whereas I would argue that both Shrine of the Monkey God and any of the stories in Killing and Dying are, are tend to have a more universal focus and maybe a little bit more complexity in terms of um, both drawing style and in terms of subject matter. So, you know, but, but that said, I also have enjoyed a lot of these comics that I probably wouldn't have looked at otherwise unless I heard about them on your shows. Um, and that especially goes for something like Kyler Roberts' um, pow- Powdered Milk, which I loved. I thought it was great. In fact, I could see teaching it um, mm-hmm. because it, it follows um, – it's, it's, again, an autobiographical comic, and it follows her experiences from being sort of a young girl up through being a, a new mother. And in fact, those last comics um, where she's she's basically depicting what it's like to to absolutely adore your child, but also to feel so unbelievably exhausted and almost terrified with the responsibility of parenthood um, really comes through well. And uh, so I could easily see teaching it in an autobiographical comics class. Um, So I'm really I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I like 
um, the fact that there's such a broad range of comics in this particular con, as opposed to, you know, with Eisner, um, almost any time, like when I think about the Eisner nominations, I'd read almost every single comic Mm -hmm. that was nominated for the Eisners. And so for me, it's great to sort of see the way that sorts out. Um, but it's it do, it's not the same feeling for me of of exploration and discovery because you know as you well know you can only read so much in any given year yeah <laughs> you know and I found that this was a great experience for me because there's a lot of comics that I'd either heard of and hadn't had a chance to read um, that certainly is true of Radishes by Carolyn Nowak I'd heard of it I just hadn't sat down and read it although we were talking yesterday I confused it temporarily with carrots which is another <laughs> comic that came up this year and I'm thinking God this is the year of the vegetable um but I was really excited then to be able to read it. So. Right. You know, you mentioned Powdered Milk. That is one of those titles that I had never heard of before it was nominated for an Ignatz. And, and for me, that's one of the joys of the Ignatz nominations every year because it introduces me to a variety of small press titles or independently published or self-published titles I didn't know was out there. You know, mm-hmm. So some of these titles that I recognize – I mean if we just stick with, let's say, the Outstanding Series category, I knew about Ganges. I knew about Demon, I knew about Cartosia Tales, and I knew about, even though I hadn't read, Meg, Mog, and Owl. I did not know about Powdered Milk. Now, I did get the opportunity to talk with Kyla Roberts, and we'll hear that in one of the episodes in the oh, days good. to come. Um, and, and, and we talked about the way that she writes her story. Her, Powdered Milk is a different kind of autobiographical comic because it, it comes out as a as a mini comic. You can find them online as well. And in fact, she has collected uh, a number of her earlier Powdered Milk stories in a collection called Misery Land, which uh, Kyler was kind enough to send the two of us a PDF right. of that. So you know, thank you, Kyler, for doing so. But yeah. it's a different kind of autobiographical comic in that with each installment or each issue of Powdered Milk, you don't get a self-contained story. You get moments of Kyler's mm-hmm. life, her and her family's right. life. And so sometimes those moments take up, let's say, just a single page. Mm-hmm. At other times, it's a very short story, which takes place over, let's say, two or maybe three pages – But it reminds me of an autobiographical comic that reflects life because many times life is nothing more than a series of moment, 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 one right after another that aren't necessarily uh, connected in one way uh, or any way. And and so that's what many of the stories in Powdered Milk do. I mean they're just there. They're moments in Kyler's life. And that's it. If you try to find connections, yeah. I mean, there's the larger connecting tissue of this being Kyler Roberts's life, of course. But other than that, you know, it's it's difficult to link one to the other. But that's fine. But that that's the style of uh, this kind of comic. You know, I would say that it that it does have a very strong regional feel. Um, she's from the upper Midwest where I currently live. And there I saw a lot of commonalities in the way that her family interacts around holidays, Mm -hmm. um, especially, but, but it's fascinating because I also think about my hot date, which creates a very specific feeling of late 1990s, um, Southwest U S right. And it does it really well. So for those of you who are interested just in regionalism, those are two comics I'd suggest reading for place as well. Right. Now, you were mentioning the Midwest. Uh, Another text that definitely has a Midwest feel to it is Carol Tyler's Soldier's Heart. And, you know, as I mentioned, I had the pleasure of of talking with Carol Tyler in a a one-on-one sit-down, and that interview went up yesterday, so make sure you check out the Comics Alternative website uh, to to listen to that. Uh, and, And, you know, much of what goes on in Soldier's Heart takes place in the Midwest. Uh, now, um, have you read Soldier's Heart? I haven't. Okay. Oh, it, it is it is an extremely moving memoir, and it's about um, her attempts to understand what happened to her father during World War II. Um, Charles, or Chuck Tyler, uh, was, was one who was, saw a lot of action during the Second World War. And so when she was growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, her relationship with her father was at times trying because he was a great father. But there was something going on with him that was linked to his experience at the war 
that caused a big question mark in her life and I think the life of her family. And so what went on with her father affected the way that she and other family members interacted with her as, as well as family and friends, other family and friends. So this book is an attempt to understand what was going on with her father and to try to get at the heart, so to speak, of his experience during the war. But Soldier's Heart is also very, very much – Carol Tyler story. Uh, I think most people, when they discuss Soldier's Heart, think of it in terms of her father's story, and it is. But Uh I think it's at least as much her story as it is her father's. And and I mentioned that during the interview. And she said, I'm glad that you said that. Most people don't see it that way. Um, But but I'm mentioning this because most of the action that takes place is in the Midwest, either uh, Indiana, Ohio, or Kentucky. So it definitely has that feel to it. So you should definitely check that out. Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the reasons I have kind of avoided it, honestly, is I am the daughter of a World War II veteran oh. um, and who grew up in the 60s and 70s. And my dad saw a lot of action. Um, he was drafted at 18 um, and uh, was sent over to – he was in the Battle of the Bulge and was in the group of soldiers who moved across Germany, among other things, liberating concentration camps. And he really never talked a lot about the war, but towards the end of his life when he was ill and um, – Um, and uh, sort of was going through some anxiety over that, he did start to talk about some of his experiences. And I I realized at that point that it had impacted his entire life in ways that really because he just hadn't mentioned it. And I will say there are a lot of World War II vets who are sadly no longer with us, um, but who um, really didn't talk a lot about it. So I've kind of put off reading it, but I'm, I definitely plan to. And it sounds like an amazing book, and I love her so much. She's such a great comics creator, and I guess we have something in common. So yeah. uh, next time I'm at a comics con, I'll, I'll definitely seek her out because I'd love to to share stories with her about that. But mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I was actually um, – we're about the same age, Derek, but most of my friends – parents actually hadn't seen any action. Most of them were born at such a time that they were even too young for Korea, but my dad was older than my mom. Mm. And so I was the only kid I knew in my whole grade school actually who had a parent who'd been in World War II. So it wasn't also like we were all sitting around talking about that. For me, it was, um, I was sort of the only one. So anyway, that's just a digression, but it sounds like an amazing comic. Yeah, it is. And, you know, sticking with this category, outstanding graphic novel, I mean, let, let's look at this for a moment because there is kind of a pattern here, and it's interesting which book was chosen as the winner of that category. All but one of the five are what I would consider, you know, classic storytelling, right? In in other words, you have a beginning, middle, and end, even if it's a part of a series. So um, we have a book that I think it was Andy Wolverton and I discussed early this year, uh, Josh Cotter's Not Away. Um, it is definitely a narrative in the classic sense, even though this is the first of what I think will be seven different books or volumes in a series, uh, but it tells a story. Then there's Gabby Schultz's Sick, which is autobiographical, but it does tell the story of him being ill at one point and how that sickness really affected him and got him to thinking about larger issues like the state of the world, right? right. Uh, and then we have the aforementioned Soldier's Heart. Uh, but then we also have Durf Back Durf's Trashed, <laughs> which is an autobiography in many ways, even though he doesn't call it an autobiography, or at least he uses his life. Durf uses his life as a springboard into this work of fiction because he's called it a work of fiction. Uh, but again, it, it, it is a story in the classical sense. But the winner of that category, L- Lisa Hannawalt's Hot Dog Taste Test, isn't a storybook. Uh, if anything, it's a series of, I don't know if y'all, I would call them gag strips or one-off comics, observations, but it definitely stands out from the other books in that category. And I'm wondering what you made of the fact that this book got the nod from the attendees at SPX this year? Well, first of all, I think it's part of, okay, I I, I can't get into the minds of the attendees per se, but I will say one thing. It reminds me a lot of Lucy Nisley's Relish. 
And in fact, her comic style reminds me a great deal of Nisley. And Nisley is very well known to, to most millennials. You know, if, if they've read a comic, in fact, in my classes, I just, you know, I typically ask my students what they've read or I ask them to do a little diagnostic where they tell me what comics they've read. And very often Lucy Nisley comes up because her book French Milk was so popular among young readers. It dealt with her sort of study abroad in France. And, you know, that that's very relevant to the lives of many young people. And frankly, she's had really great publicity for her comics. So she's pretty well known. The minute that I opened up Hot Dog Taste Test, I was like, oh, wow, OK, <laughs> this looks a lot like Lucy, Lucy Nisley's Relish, which was um, Nisley's book, I think about two or three years ago, that discussed her lifelong experiences with food because she's the daughter of chefs and she also has worked in um, in food retail and she loves to cook. And so um, when I started to read Hot Dog Taste Test, it had some of the same feel to it. But I also am wondering, Derek, and I don't know if this is something that you might have been getting at, too, is that if it's voted on on the day and maybe people are just interacting with these comics on site, um, reading through a couple of the short sort of one-offs within um, Hot Dog Taste Test might have given people a, a sense for what that comic was about. Mm-hmm. And maybe they felt more comfortable voting for it. But it is interesting that it's the only one because actually, tell you the truth, I found all of these interesting, the ones that I did look at, but probably the one that made me look at things I didn't want to think about the most, you know, is was trashed. <laughs> like I know a lot of information now on how many landfills there are <laughs> and how big they are and how we're all really like, like trash should be like our big concern. <laughs> right. But yeah, I I mean, I wonder if maybe some of it was the one-off nature of it. What were you thinking? Yeah, I think it's the one-off. Also, Hot Dog Taste Test is an extremely funny book. I mean, I laughed my ass off most of the time that I was reading that. Um, so it, it, it's a funny book, and and not only the situations that Hannah Wald writes about, but also the art. I mean, that's a big part of the humor as well. And as much as I enjoyed reading Hot Dog Taste Test, I didn't. Okay, make a di- I want to make a distinction between liking and appreciating. I like all of these books, right. but I appreciate them in different ways. So, for instance, I can see what, let's say, Carol Tyler is doing with Soldier's Heart and what Josh Cotter is doing with Not Away. I appreciate that in a very different way. I see them as more ambitious in many ways than what I see going on with Hot Dog Taste Test. And so – you know, I, personally, I wanted Carol Tyler to win for Soldier's Heart, and for this selfish reason, during my interview with her, <laughs> she said that if I win, I'm going to, when I go up to the stage to accept the prize, sing. And so when they were naming the nominees, I had my camera ready. Uh, I had my um, my cell phone or the uh, the smartphone set to video. So I was going <laughs> to include that, record that and include it in the show notes with uh, my interview with her again that went up yesterday. It didn't happen. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, again, I enjoyed uh, the humor in Hot Dog Taste Test. It was fun to read. But I have to tell you, a book like Hot Dog Taste Test. As much as I enjoy reading that, I don't anticipate picking that up again anytime soon, whereas a book like Not Away, Trashed, Sick, or especially A Soldier's Heart, mm-hmm. I would have reread those. And those are books that I would be more apt to teach. I mean I could teach any of those four. I don't see myself teaching at all Hot Dog Taste Test outside of maybe an example of comics humor that is not story-based. You know, it's it's funny you say that because I was just sitting here thinking about maybe my reading of comics is so biased by my role as a teacher that sometimes I tend to gravitate towards comics that I think have the kind of substance that I could use in a classroom, mm-hmm. you know, and have a sustained discussion. But look, I'm thinking in about four weeks, I'm so excited to teach Nick Drasno's Beverly. Oh, so you are and, teaching that. Yeah, I am teaching it. And I'm really interested in in the kind of discussions that my students are going to have. I have an interesting lead up to it as well because I'm teaching um, Day Tripper by Moon and Ba. Oh, um, I do that one mainly to talk about time in comics. And then I'm teaching, of course, part of what I call the mirepoix of comics instruction, right? There's Persepolis, Fun Home, Mouse, and I'm teaching Fun Home. Um, <laughs> but then I'm following that up with Beverly. And um, for our listeners who aren't yet familiar with this particular text, it was nominated for Outstanding Anthology or Collection. And one of the things that I noticed 
actually about that category, Derek, is that both Beverly and Killing and Dying, Dying by Adrian Tomine, both of those books really deal with suburban life, with um, with interpersonal relationships in a really deep way. And in some way or another, even if the stories aren't directly connected, as in Killing and Dying, you sort of feel that those people live in the same space. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit different with the book that won, which was Step Aside Pops. I love Kate Beaton. I mean, I, I, I view her as like the most awesome person ever, but I wouldn't see myself teaching her collection, say, simply because I think that with Beverly, there's a, there's a lot for students to talk about in terms of sort of the intertext among the different stories in the collection. There is a sort of sustained movement in Beverly towards a specific inclusion, and that's really satisfying for me as a teacher. But again, I sometimes wonder if that's just my bias as someone who's trying to anticipate class discussion and what students will pick up on and what kind of conversations we can have in terms of relating, say, the way that young people are depicted in Beverly versus the way they're depicted in Day Tripper or Fun Home. So anyway, it's, it's kind of interesting to sort of think about the teacher bias, which oh, yeah. you know, is something that I think really works pretty strongly, especially for me in the Young Readers show. I'm always sort of thinking about, well, okay, how would this comic go over in a classroom too? So Yeah, and you know, I, I'm the same way. And now that you're mentioning this, I think that with most of us who co-host a show for the Comics Alternative, which has now become more of a network than just a single podcast, <laughs> um, I mean, that's what um, – I think we think about without realizing it. I know that that's something that Andy Kunkka and I dis- – well, we don't really discuss it, but I think the kind of things we discuss in terms of possibilities are those kind of texts that we enjoy and that would possibly be teachable in one way or another. And this gets to maybe a difference – you know, this issue we've touched upon already, the difference between what we expect, you and I expect as readers, and what maybe a Again, not to stereotype, but a, a broader general SPX audience would kind of read the kind of text okay. that they would gravitate toward. Now, you know, you and I discussed Beverly earlier this year. I did not realize at the time that that was made up of individual stories that you would consider a collection. Did you? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, but but maybe because I don't know. You know, I have to tell you a little secret about my past. I had Uh-oh. like an should obsession. I, should yes. I sit down? Sh- no, don't worry. It's so geeky. You're going to just crack up. But I had an obsession with James Joyce as a kid. Okay. I know. We all have our – like for me, it was Taxidermy and Theodore Roosevelt and James Joyce. It was a great childhood. But um, but on a serious level, when I went to the University of London and um, did my master's there, I had the opportunity to study Joyce with, at the time, one of the preeminent Joyceans, a guy called Charlie Peake. And he had written a wonderful book on Joyce. And he was one of those um, sort of – uh, sort of old school literary critics. He had simply torn apart those stories in such a way that you could really see how they, the web of structure with them. And so I sort of became obsessed with short story collections mm-hmm. and I, I gravitated towards them. And I, Beverly is one of the first comic short story collections where the stories really are corresponding with each other in deep thematic ways. And so maybe I just really glommed onto that because it's something I really love. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. I think reading Beverly as a one, like in a more novelistic way uh, makes sense to me, but also the individual segments, you know, do stand on their own in terms of the stories. It's just, I didn't read it in the latter sense when you and I discussed that earlier this year, but, you know, sticking with this category, outstanding anthology or collection, um, to me, this was, okay, this was one category and, and I voted that I thought in terms of what deserved it was a no brainer. And, and maybe this is the academic or historian coming out in me, and that is the complete women's comic collection. Uh, I thought because of what this does, because what Trina Robbins pulled together, and what women's comics as – you know, it, it didn't last for that long really in the larger scheme of things, but it was extremely important. So for that reason alone – and it's a nice collection. I mean it's a beautiful box collection – that this was hands down the – text that deserved to win for outstanding anthology or collection but step aside pops got it and and to me i'm like i'm with you i love kate beaton i especially love her sense of humor and and in in that way i tend to see kate beaton in ways similar to lisa hannawalt right i mean Mm -hmm. i do think that beaton has more of a sense of story in her comics than hannawalt does 
and as much as I like step step aside pops, they're done in one. And like you had mentioned previously, I can't see myself doing anything with this text. Definitely in the classroom, I don't know if I'll read it again. Maybe I will, but if I do, I'll pick it up and I'll read like a bit here and a bit there. In other words, it's one of those books that you can easily flip through. But the thing about women's comics, the complete women's comics, I mean, man, I mean, this is a project. I mean, this is something that has some historical significance, and it also includes many of the female creators that were so significant to this most recent – who who led the way to this mm-hmm. most recent generation of younger female creators. In other words, without the people collected in the complete women's comics, we wouldn't have comics in the way that we do now. Yeah, and again, I think that maybe has to do a little bit with how these these awards are voted on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I actually, I'm sure you've seen Trina speak before. I've seen her speak twice now. And the last time I saw her, she was talking about putting together this collection, and it's truly a life's work for her. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, yeah, I I was a little surprised too, but then again, maybe not. I have a feeling that um, that... I don't know. I, I agree. I think that there's a that this book, when you talk about teaching, I mean, you know, teaching a history of comics course, this is now a wonderful resource um, right. for those of us who, who want our students to understand um, what has come before. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it I think it does reflect, though, maybe the the way that the voting occurs as well. Yeah. Now, so, now, you know, I was talking about the complete women's comics collection in terms of demographics, but we can also discuss it in terms of economics. And I think this is another reason why Mm. so many people apparently at SPX this year did not vote for complete women's comics. All the other category or all the other texts within this category are relatively inexpensive, right? In other words, it, it won't break the bank to buy it. Uh, not so much with the complete women's comics. Uh, the complete women's comics is, I can't remember how much, but it's over 50 or 60 bucks. Yeah, that's that. I get that too. It's more like a reference text in that way. Exactly. So for its pricing. So I think for the vast majority of the attendees, uh, the price is prohibitive. And so they may not be aware of this book. And if we do have a younger audience that is attending SPX, they may have heard of women's comics. I don't, I'm not even sure if that's the case. But even if they had, chances are they didn't shell out for that nice box set. Now, yeah, it's actually $100. Oh, wow, it is. Maybe I can. Yeah, oh. I'm on the Fantagraphics website. It's listed as $100. Okay. So I guess I was. Uh, um... If you get the Carol Tyler book plate, it's another 25 which I probably am now going to do because I'm wow. a nerd. But okay, I was. I'm also was, an employed professor nerd. So okay, <laughs> you know. see, I was going by the Amazon price. Actually, at Amazon.com, you can get the entire collection for sixty-eight bucks. Well, that's great. And in fact, our listeners, if you want to check out the complete women's comics, definitely go to comicsalternative.com. Go to our sponsor page where you will find a link to Amazon. And if you purchase the complete women's comics through that click through, we'll get a tiny cut. So take away from uh, Bezos and give to the comics alternative. How's that for a plug? That sounds like a great plug. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I do think that there's an economics issue going on there as well. But, right. um, yeah, the, uh, you know all the books in this category I'm familiar with, with the exception of Beyond the Queer Sci-Fi and Fantasy Anthology. Yeah, I definitely want to take a look at that. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't even seen it, so that's something that I want to look at. Yeah, and you know I did reach out to the editors of that collection to tell them what we were going to do, and th- you know they were kind enough to respond, and they gave us a link where we could purchase the book. But <laughs> you know, it, getting a hold of everything uh, would break the bank of uh, the comics alternatives, so we're just not able to to do that if we don't already personally at least own copies of these books. So that's why we really can't speak with any kind of authority about the Beyond collection. But, uh, Gwen, I think that you and I can definitely speak with some kind of authority when it comes to the outstanding artist category because I think most of these names – well, no, 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 no. I was about to say most of these names would be recognizable, but I take that back. Um, I think that those familiar with comics will know the names Noah Van Sciver, Kevin Huenziga, and Daniel Klaus – They may not be familiar with Tilly Walden, and I don't think they would be familiar with Ryan Heshka. Now, were you familiar with uh, Ryan Heshka? No, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, 
his book that came out from No Brow, Mean Girls Club, is it, just a lot of fun. It's a short piece, and it's part of uh, No Brow's what seven? What is that called? That, that series of of small pamphlet comics, really short stories. Um, it, it's part of that. But I had not known uh, Heshka's work before that. So it surprised me a little bit that he was in the Outstanding Artist category. Um, All the other names, though, that I recognized. And maybe a big elephant in the room that we can go ahead and discuss is Daniel Klaus and and Patience because his name – was quite prominent at XBX this year. Now, I didn't meet him in person, but I kept seeing him all over the place. Now, Fanagraphics at SPX was celebrating its 40th anniversary. And in fact, on Saturday night after the award ceremony, there was this big cake that uh, the various people at Fanagraphics cut into. There was a big Okay, now you're making me really sad. (laughs) Yeah. Because I love cake. (laughs) <laughs> love cake, love Daniel Klaus, love That's fanographics, right. you know, what's not to love? But uh, but yeah, it was a big to-do, and so Daniel Klaus was there. I saw him. He was on a number of panels. Um, he got no love whatsoever at the Ignatz. Yes, this is true. I and, find that interesting. Yeah, and again, I think it has something to do with the demographics of SPX, because I think that People Okay, the winner for the Outstanding Artist category was Tilly Walden in her book that came out last year, The End of Summer. I would think that – and again, maybe I am making false assumptions here, but for the majority of the attendees, they may recognize the name Tilly Walden before they would recognize the name Daniel Klaus. But for those of us who have been reading comics for quite a while, Daniel Klaus, that's a no-brainer. Of course we know who he is. I mean this is the you know the eight-ball guy, right? Uh, this is the guy who did Ghost World. This is the guy who did Wilson. This is the guy who came out with this big media event earlier this year, Patience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because most of my students say that they do know him. Mm-hmm. And they're, most of them are in their early 20s. And in fact, on the first day of Class of Ghost World comes up again and again for young readers. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's, I don't know, Derek. I mean, I wasn't there. But my sense, I was a little bit surprised. I understand why Fantagraphics is in this category and at this show or con or whatever, but to me, they, they feel more mainstream now than they used to as well. I don't know. You yeah, know? Yeah, I guess so. Um, well, it, it sounds funny talking about Daniel Klaus within the context of the mainstream, but I guess it depends on how we define the mainstream. Now, definitely right. not mainstream in terms of big two, um, right. but of the kind of presses that you will see at Small Press Expo, Fanagraphics and Drawn and Quarterly are the biggies. Uh, And in fact, in the hall, where they place the Fantagraphics tables, plural, because it's a big space, and where they place the drawn and quarterly tables are on opposite ends of the ballroom. And so they're like the twin pillars, right, that are right there in the front as you come into the main doors. And one is on either side. And then the smaller presses and then the self-publishers – you know, or you know, make up the and, rest of the, right. the ballroom. But yeah, those are, I guess, the big presses within the context of Small Press Expo. But still, you know, Patience is a small press book, depending on your definition. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think it's just people not being as aware, uh, or at least as enamored of Klaus, as they are of, uh, let's say, Tilly Walden and other younger readers. Because, I mean, Klaus didn't win. He was also nominated for, let me see, what was the other category? Well, actually, it's funny, too, because I was looking at it under the other category when... Oh, Outstanding Comic. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he he was nominated for that, and he was beaten out by Sam Bosma, who did, this is another no-brow book, Fantasy Sports Number 1, which I thought was a fun story. Yeah, but I I didn't see it as being in the same level as... 
as patients, but that's just maybe my taste. Exactly. So. Well, you know, with the Outstanding Comics category, um, and this is interesting, the, the nominees were As the Crow Flies, Be Good, Fantasy Sports Number 1, Patience, and Shrine of the Monkey God. Now, I've already told you about my love of Kim Deitch and uh, Shrine of the Monkey God, and I think you feel the same. I mean, to mm-hmm. me, this was – I mean, for that category, Outstanding Comic, similar to Outstanding Story, a no-brainer. This should have gotten it. Although I can see patience. Um, now, the others, I think, are very well deserving. Uh, I really enjoyed Martz's Be Good because it was a short in and out piece, a mini comic, if you will. And in fact, I actually got you, you know, and I were sent a digital copy. I got a hard mm-hmm. copy from Martz when I was at SPX, and I even interviewed him briefly uh, for the podcast. Great. Um, I thought it was great because he writes about in the story Be Good. Uh, being uh, a designer, but it's a story that doesn't start off about being a designer, and and it's kind of an ironic take on himself in many ways, and he points this out in my interview. I mean, I thought that that was a, a fun story. One that I thought, though, that was quite more involved that I'm a little surprised it's in the outstanding comic category, though, was Melanie Gilman's As the Crow Flies, and the reason I'm a little surprised about that is that it is a webcomic. Mm-hmm. Now, that to me would have been perfect for an outstanding online comic nominee. Of course, it, you know it, it, it's, it's a good nominee for outstanding comic as well. But I think that uh, that would have been better served as an online comic nomination. The thing about As the Crow Flies, it, it's a web comic that when I looked at it, I thought, okay, so this is a web version of something that's already out in print. But it's not. And the reason I thought that this was a print publication is that Gilman uses colored pencils to do her art. And it does mm-hmm. have that feel and that look of print. Yeah, you know, this whole category fascinated me because I think that if it had been in a in an awards category where the where it was going to be judged by a panel – Mm-hmm. of comics creators and comics critics or whatever that this would be a, you would never have this set this this set of texts in one category right because they're so different too that was one of the things like <clears throat> for um you know outstanding online comic for those i mean they were all online mm-hmm. <laughs> you know i mean they they were basically maybe not the same lengths but they 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 appeared to belong in that category i found this to be a really complicated category because my thoughts about patience which is an extremely long you know, sustained long form comic are even very different than my feelings about Shrine of the Monkey God, which is very compact or fantasy sports number one, which has an entirely different feel to it. All of them felt really so radically different. Mm -hmm. It just felt like, okay, here's this category. (laughs) We're just going to put a bunch of comics in it. And there's a lot of repeats in this category too. Right. Um, of other, you know, of texts that, that were in other categories. So I don't know. It seemed like a sort of interesting, interesting. It was difficult to, to discern what those texts had in common, except that they were in the form of comics. Right. Yeah. There's, uh, you know? This raises the question of category definition, and this is where things get a little slippery at times. I mean, for example, uh, with outstanding artists under that category, I mean, I don't know if it's absolutely necessary to list a particular work next to the artist who is nominated, because it's not for a book. It's for outstanding artists. Now, as as an example of that, the winner, Tilly Walden, the book listed under this category nomination was The End of Summer. But over the past year, Tilly Walden has come out with at least three books. And so The End of Summer was her very first. So, um, you know, I love this part, which was also nominated and won under best, or I guess promising promising, new talent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Promising new talent. You know, um, or in the city, I think is another one of that that could be included here. So, I mean, why do you need to list a title for outstanding artist? And then we get to categories like outstanding story, and especially the aforementioned outstanding comic. It gets a little slippery. Now, I look at the um, Small Press Expo Ignatz page that defines these categories, and under outstanding comic, it reads. A comic nominated in this category should represent what the juror feels is the best marriage of both art and story in a single issue of a comic. Now, I don't want to nitpick, but if we're talking about issues of comics, then what does that say about As the Crow Flies? As much as I love that series, 
it's an online comic, at least as of now, although Melody Gilman, when I spoke with her over the weekend, she did say that she's soon going to be coming out with a print version of this. So um, should it be under outstanding comic category? I don't know. Um it's it's one of those things that that make you wonder, and, and you know, and we mentioned in terms of outstanding story with the example of Tomini's killing and dying. Is it the book or it's the story? It's a little unclear here because under that same category, we have Simon Hanselman's Mag and Mog in Amsterdam from that book, but then elsewhere. On the list of nominees, we have, in, in terms of the Outstanding Series, Meg, Mog, and Owl. Um, yeah, sometimes trying to understand what these categories are all about or the rationale for what was included becomes uh, an, an exercise in frustration. Although I will just say this, I mean, for for me, there are a couple of comics we haven't mentioned yet that do stand out, and there it came a point I think when you when you set the goal of just trying to read as many comics as you can off of a big long list, you just they all start to flow together, and I will admit then I had to step back and say what is that doing in that category or whatever. But I do really want to give mention to Carolyn Nowak's radishes. Mm-hmm. Which I know off can't, off mic we talked about how much we really enjoyed that comic and um, it's a it's a, it's a fantasy text to a certain extent about two young girls who um, who learn a little bit about their own self con- concept their own self image um, but it's a very fun comic and uh, beautifully drawn mm-hmm. and so it, it won the outstanding mini comic and so i just wanted to to give a, a hat tip to that comic as well i'd recommend it and it's again it's very you know it's it's a mini comic but and you were saying you wish that there was more of it and i kind of do as well i i was sorry when it was over i wanted to to learn more about the characters oh yeah and, and in fact i did speak with carolyn at spx and again that brief conversation will be in an upcoming episode and i specifically asked her if there is more in this series dealing with these characters and she said no which well, maybe su- you will encourage her to i hope to do so more. i was surprised because after i finished reading radishes i mean i do think it stands on its own but it has me wanting more in other words i want to find out more about these these, these two women um what kind of world they live in because you mentioned it's a it's a fantasy world of some sort and so there's a lot of potential there and, and especially in terms of world building. And I think that there's a lot of possibility here. Now, whether Noack goes on to, to build this world or just goes on to other stories, you know, that's up to her. But I really would like to see more of uh, what we get with Radishes. But you mentioned the outstanding mini comic category, and I'm glad you did, because like the outstanding online comic category, it's one of the most cohesive of this grouping. Uh, now, for this, we have uh, Sophie Franz as the experts, which we talked on the Comics Alternative about two or three months ago. Uh, there's also Pranus's No Eukaitis's Laffy Meal, which I want to talk about in a moment, Maps to the Sun by Sloan Leong, Radishes, and then The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest by <laughs> Luke Healy. Um, what did you think of uh, No Eukaitis's Laffy Meal? Well, remember, I never got that comic. Oh, you never got it? I never got it. So, oh. you, so Derek, what did you think about okay. Laffy Meal? Okay. Actually, you may be getting it soon because when I spoke with Piranus, uh, he told me that he was able, right before he sent it, he got my email letting him know that you would be the one co-hosting this episode. So maybe it'll take a while. Maybe you'll get it today or tomorrow. But he did mail it to you, he said. Well, um, that's exci- I'm excited to get it because I know you really liked it. So tell me about it. I did. You know, it, it, it's it's nothing deep or heavy. You know, for instance, it won't scratch your itch of, let's say, your love of James Joyce. But I like <laughs> what he does. And I think it, in some ways it's a mini comic version of Chris Ware's building stories in that it's not really a text, right? It's not really a mini comic. It is a package. Uh, with multiple mini comics, and what uh, No Eukaitis does is he presents Laffy Meal in a bag. And in fact, if you, when I went to his table at SPX, he had Laffy Meal out for people to buy, and they were in little white bags that looked like carryout bags from a fast food place, right, from a burger joint. And it even has on the front the image of the company, the fictional company in the story, Burger Clown. And, oh, no. This is great. I'm yeah. excited now. And yeah. inside – in fact, let me get my copy. 
I have it right here. I will empty the bag, and it has several different components. In fact, it has five different components, uh, each in the shape and somewhat appearance of something that would be in a takeout bag from a burger joint. There is a mini comic that is about this, well, relatively speaking, the proportions of a boxed burger. There okay. is a mini comic that is in the shape of a ketchup packet. There is a mini comic that is in the shape of a drink that you would get with a meal. There's also one that looks like fries. And the fifth comic in this Laffy Meal package it looks like something that would be a toy in a Happy Meal, although this is called Laffy Meal. So you have these five smaller mini comics that make up the larger package of Laffy Meal as a mini comic. Now, the story you get among the five different really small mini comics is basically the same but from a different perspective. And it's a simple story. It is a family of four that go and a dog uh, that go to a burger joint, a place called Burger Clown. They get a meal. They, they have some tension. There's a little drama, and then they leave. And that's it. So it's a very simple story. But each of these smaller mini-comics within the package is from a different perspective. So, for instance, the burger... Um, the boxed burger mini comic is from the perspective of the father, a guy named Dan. The drink mini comic is from the perspective of the mother, Claire. The fries is from the perspective of the older son, Ted. The laughy meal is from the perspective of the younger son, Joe. And then the ketchup packet is, is from the dog that's left in the car named Sparky. <laughs> I'm glad we've kept to the gender hierarchy of the dad being the burger and the mom being the drink. Yeah. That's awesome. But, <laughs> but I love that. I love the kid being the small fry. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, at least the mother wasn't the ketchup packet. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Something that you put on a burger to make it taste better. It's Freudian hour at the Comics Alternative. That's right. So, yeah, I think that um, that was one of the comics that I wanted to win uh, just because it stood out as a different right. kind of story. Um, you know, another comic, though, that stood out in that category, Outstanding Mini Comic, was Lou Keeley's The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest. And the reason why I really appreciated that one, it is a longer mini comic and also a bigger one. Now, you and I were reading an online or digital version of this. I did get a hard copy of Cuckoo's Nest when I was at SPX. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, uh, that's notable about this, it, is, it mixes media. OK, so there's the comic component, but there's also a more prose or drama uh, component as well, because some of it is written as like a like a screenplay or, you know, a, a play. Uh, and then also Healy incorporates photographs as well. And so there were times when I was reading this that I could tell a photograph was a photograph. But at other times, for instance, in the representation of the house. At times I wondered, now, is this a photograph that's embedded in this comic, or is it highly realistic illustration? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, and, and there's the page where he's talking about A.B. Dave Cadbury looks almost exactly like her ex-husband. I think it's page two, mm -hmm. and that really looks like a photo to me. That if is that's a photo. A yeah, I mean, it, it just does, and it, it's, it's, I love the way it's collaged in there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a weird form of mini collage. It is. It is. And so, well, again, that and Laffy Meal, I think, were the two experiments in that category. But I, I really think that every one of those comics uh, in, in the in the mini comic category stood out. I mean, it makes sense to me that Carol Nowak won for Radishes. But honestly, I think that any one of these winning wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. And and again, they felt cohesive. And I'm excited about Laffy Meal, though. Now you've got me really excited because I love things that are are done like that. I'm like I I own two copies of Building Stories, mm, two? not just one. Yes, well I I teach with it too, and um, that's a text I sometimes don't assign um, because it's not only is it pretty expensive, but it's it's cumbersome for students to bring in. So I own a couple copies of it. So you know, typically though, I make my students sit on absolutely opposite sides of the room so that the two, like when they put it back together, I don't have things starting to cross across the sets. I'm, I'm that 
anal about it, but oh. I love things that come together like this. Wow. I love that materiality of, of a text that part of the enjoyment of reading it is taking it apart. I think it's a lot of fun. You know, I did not know that you taught building stories. Ha, ha, do you know about the handout that I created for that? No, I do not. Oh, in fact, do go to the Comics Alternative website and do a search for building stories and you'll see the show where we discuss that and in preparing for that show what I did was now I've never taught it but I created a handout that I would use and if I taught this and basically what it does is it provides some kind of cohesion or as much as you could when it right. comes to the larger narrative or narratives that are going on and how they connect one to the other that's exciting. You know, I had my students, it was the last class of the semester, and I felt that was appropriate because they'd spent, you know, 14 weeks getting to know a lot about comics. And so when I, I sat these out, I gave them about an hour and a half in groups to read through different parts and to talk with each other. And then we got back together as a class. But if I were going to assign it as something that students were to read on their own, I'd love to have that handout. So it's really generous of you, Derek. Oh, yeah. And that's awful. It's online. Oh, just... It's awesome that you did that though that's really helpful yeah now who, who knows so. I mean, it could be a, a complete piece of crap but uh, you can look at it no, and judge for yourself no 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 it will not be a complete piece of crap it's yeah. a derrick royal production please a derrick royal production um <laughs> Well, you know, getting getting back to the list of the nominees. So one of the things that the outstanding mini comic category had with another category, promising new art, promising new talent, is that the majority, if not almost all, I guess, of the nominees I was not aware of. Now I knew about Sophie France because we discussed the experts uh, on a previous episodes, but the other four are under the outstanding mini comic. I didn't know about. I think I had seen the name Luke Healy, but I did not know about the unofficial cuckoo's nest. You know, something similar with promising new talent. I'm looking through this list. You know, Kevin Budnick, uh, Maya Kubabi, Sarah Lautman, Carolyn Nowak, and Tilly Walden. Tilly Walden was the only name that I recognized. Now, she won this for her work. I love this part. Um, which is one of the, what, hundreds of comics she came out over the past year, uh, it seems. Um, but this was an opportunity for me to learn about some of these people. Now, we were able to get our hands on Budnick's handbook, hands okay. on handbook. Um, and of course, Noax Radishes and Tilly Walden's I Love This Part. Uh, of course, we also got, you know, we were able to find The Ultimate Laugh and Grape Nuts by Sarah Lautman. And then there was Maya Kobabi's Tom O. Bedlam. Now, Gwen, what did you think of that? Well, it's basically a graphic poem. It's an already existing text, and, and she's added these very beautiful drawings. It's it's um, almost, I, I don't know the technical term for it, but almost all the backgrounds are black, and then the, the lines are white. Um, it's beautifully drawn. I read it pretty quickly, but um, it certainly is worth looking at. She's really a talented artist. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I thought you'd read that. But then again, you sent me handbook, and I forgot about that. Yeah. So part of this is just getting a hold of all of these. It, it is really challenging, and they start to flow together. Mm -hmm. But I had read, of course, Tilly Walden um, for a show that we did um, earlier this year. Um, I just do want to make a little point about, about Walden. You know, she just her work just got picked up by first second. Um, press. And so she's going to move right out of this category into a more mainstream publisher now. So I, I found it kind of interesting that she won two awards um, in SPX and, uh, and now she's moving off into a more mainstream publisher. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a shift in her style or her work. But I didn't mean to interrupt. I mean, I, I'd love to hear what you thought about Lautman. Um, it's a really good category, actually. It's an interesting category. Yeah, I like the work of Lautman. Uh, so, for for example, with Grape Nuts, you have a family situation, right? And it's about what goes on one afternoon in, in, in a backyard uh, and also what could potentially go wrong in that backyard. Uh, but we also – I mean in this category, Lautman had a second that was listed under Promising New Talent, and that was the story The Ultimate Laugh. What did you think of that? I loved it. It reminded me so much of all of the school assemblies that we had to go on in middle in, during middle school. Basically, in this one, she's writing about when they had to see a, an informational film <laughs> about breast cancer, which is a very serious subject. Mm -hmm. But apparently, um, Jenny Garth did this public service announcement that was meant to be shown to young women regarding how to locate breast lumps. And one of the things that stuck out to me in this comic was um, 
where Lautman talks about how even though all the girls in sitting in the assembly, they were in cliques, many of them never spoke to each other um, or didn't like each other. But this this experience of group laughter really brought them together, if only for a second, because they all just started laughing hysterically, you know, in part, I think, you know, because there's Ginny Garth and you're you're looking at boobs and, you know, if you've spent any time around a middle schooler, <laughs> Uh-huh. You will know that these painful sex ed or, you know, health public service announcement assemblies, they're always so just achingly awful. And she depicts it in such an amusing way. I love her line style. It's pretty fluid, and the which I think is really good when you're trying to depict a bunch of people laughing. It really works well. So I thought they were both really funny comics, but the ultimate laugh, I, it brought back a lot of memories. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the art style. I think the art goes a long way to describing the kind of comic that uh, – uh, that the, that Lautman does because you, you say it's a loose style. I, I think of it, it also at the same time as kind of impressionistic, right? Because you get the exaggerations of the characters, their movements, their facial expressions, and, and even their anatomy. And I think that adds to the humor. So when you're going through the ultimate laugh and you see that the way that she draws the breasts that are a part of the movie, and they, they're they're ridiculous looking, but that's you know that's how these young girls are seeing this public right. service announcement so right. this I film agree. <laughs> uh but but there's that i i really enjoyed this now with with kevin budnick in handbook that is a that's a longer story and that is in diary form so uh you know uh, kevin was actually another creator that i talked to when i was at spx and have that short interview coming up in a few days um and he describes this as um when he was trying to get over a, 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 an eating disorder and a body image issue that he had and he was doing some outpatient therapy, he was keeping a diary, and the diary was these comics that we have. And so it's about over a year's period where he's reflecting upon himself, his situation, and trying to come to terms with who he is now and how that connects with how he used to be. And, and I find Handbook interesting in that his depiction of past and present is handled through different kind of color palettes, right? So mm-hmm. when he is remembering or alluding to the past in any way, you're going to find something that is much more muted and more monotone, not necessarily black black and white, um, whereas when he's writing about the present at the time that he's keeping this diary, it is in more of a vivid color. So that's a way that readers, I think, are very fluidly taken from one time period to another. Um, you know, that, I think, is a book that's very much in the tradition of autobiography, memoir comics, and it's something that I would, would guess would resonate quite well with – uh, the kind of SBX crowd, because as we mentioned, there are a lot of comics that have this memoirish feel to it. Uh, although, you know, what one was, uh, you know, Tilly Walden's I Love This Part, which also has that memoir feel, very, Absolutely. very, extremely personal, to say if it's very, is, is, is an understatement, extremely personal. You know, the one thing I'll say about Tilly Walden that I think sets her apart is that in addition to having a really great line style and um, really engaging sort of She's an engaging visual artist. But really, for me, it's the the script of her comics that stands out and promises, I think, that she's going to be really a force to be reckoned with going forward. She's so good at putting forward the inner life of a character in a way that's very particular, yet at the same time is very relatable. And I I mean, I, I love this part is is very much almost, it reads almost like a diary in its, in and of itself. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm very excited for, for, I, I, I've totally understood promising new talent for Tilly Walden because I really do think that she is just a very promising writer, Mm -hmm. um, and artist. And, uh, so that made a lot of sense to me. But what I also noticed about this category is how stylistically different these were. So even if they, they were dealing, some, most of them were dealing at least with something that was, if not about autobiographical, um, even Carolyn Nowak's text, which is set in a, in a sort of fantasy 
realm is dealing with pretty much day-to-day quotidian things that young teenage girls talk about and go through. But stylistically, there were some real differences. And mm-hmm. that's exciting. Really, that this is a great category to read if you want to get a sense for what the future of comics may look like. And like I said, you know, Tilly Walden's now going to be, I think her book Spinning is coming up pretty soon from first, second books. So it'll be interesting to see what that looks like compared to her earlier work. Right, yeah. I'm going to be really interested to see what that is like because of the Tilly Walden books that I've read so far, and I think I've read about everything that she's published in book form, the word that I take away from all of those experiences is contemplative, right? Mm, right. And for me, when I've read them by themselves, you know, so The End of Summer, I Love This Part, and In the City, when I've read those in the past – just those texts, each on its own. Uh, I think I'm able to appreciate it in a very different way than I'm experiencing with her in preparing for uh, this Ignat show because I read her works one right after another, and it's not not really overwhelming, but it's a little too much for me, I think, the contemplative aspect of that in that tone. I mean, it's very heavy. And so I think um, with the Tilly Walden that we have so far – I enjoy her much more, her texts, let's say, by themselves in isolation than looking at the larger body as of yet. So I'm curious how her storytelling may or may not change with this longer form, this new book with a new publisher, First Second. Yeah, it'll be interesting and and really good editors at first second too, I might add. Mm-hmm. And so it'll be it'll be interesting to see. And there is sort of a commonality in some ways among first second publications in terms of quality, in terms of length, in terms of just production values. So it'll be interesting to see her work in sort of what I assume will be a pretty glossy finish. Um so it'll be exciting. I'm, I I really enjoyed this, Derek, reading through all these comics. I feel like I've learned so much. Right. Know? Yeah, it's, it's a great way to introduce ourselves to series and titles that we may not have been aware of. I mean, for instance, did you know about Cartosia Tales before this? No, and I'm really glad I read them. So, you know, it's it's that – that sort of sense that this is really, I was telling, I actually taught last night and I was telling my students, I I talked to them about SPX and I told them that I was going to be recording this, this podcast. And I, I took them to the website where they could look at all the comics. I said, if you want a sense for what's going on right now, especially among newer creators, this is the list for you. And they were all like hurriedly writing it down or whatever. And so, um, so I, I think it's a really great tool for those of us who maybe don't always read independent comics um, regularly to, to get a chance. I do, but I tend to read a very narrow um, sort of segment that mainly involves comics written by women about girls, mm-hmm. right? Because that's my that's my one of my areas of study. But it's, this really opened up my horizons, and I think probably of you know gosh, at least five or six of these comics I would consider teaching in the future. So I'm really excited that that I had this opportunity. Well, next you can refer your students to the show notes of the recording that right. we're making right now. Now, now by the way, before we go, um, before we wrap up, I mentioned Cartosia Tales because Isaac Cat- Cates is a fellow academic. Oh, really? Yeah, and I first met him at MLA, and in fact, it was several years ago when they first founded the uh, discussion group of uh, graphic narrative and comics, and so he and I were both elected to that initial board, and so that's where I first met him, and then several years later, he comes out with uh, uh, this new series, Cartosia Tales, which is definitely worth checking out. It's it's more of an anthology series than anything because you have different creators, different stories that are all part of this larger narrative world. Um, but yeah, I think that that's something worth checking out, and uh, I enjoyed getting to, to see Isaac again when I was at SPX. Uh, now, someone that I did not get to meet because he is, I think, currently in France is Jason Shiga. And his demon was also part of that outstanding series list. And that strikes me as unusual. It, 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 I would think that that would come or could possibly come under outstanding online comic because demon – or have you read demon? No. Uh, before this? Now, demon, it's an online comic. But then once he gets enough story, he has been self-publishing – um, comics versions, like pamphlet versions of Demon. And then beginning early next month, we're going to get volumes of the book Demon, which basically takes 
his mini comic and single issues uh, into book form, published by First Second. Oh, great. So, Gwen, I think you and I touched upon every single category in this year's Ignance Awards, and even if we didn't talk about them in much detail, we mentioned all the nominees, and so that's quite a feat. That's right. I think we deserve, again, another award. So. Yeah, we, we deserve an award for going through all the award nominees. There we go. So we want to congratulate, obviously, all the winners, but we especially want to uh, congratulate all of the nominees for this year's Ignance Awards. That's right. You know, really, as I said, there's so many of these texts that I'm going to return to. And I just, you know, really recommend this to our readers to take a look at all the categories and all of the nominees. Mm -hmm. Now, as we've pointed out, a lot of these are um, self-published comics, mini comics that are going to be difficult to find on places like Amazon or even the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. But you know there are some of these books that you can find on DCBService.com. And if you go to the website right now, you will find great discounts on many of the titles that we have discussed. That's DCBService.com. Check them out. You won't be sorry. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about this year's discussion of the Ignance Award nominations. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message from the comfort of your own computing device through SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Go old school. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also contact us by email at two guys at comicsalternative.com or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm at Gwen at comicsalternative.com. Derek, how can folks reach you? At Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you know, you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to the website, which is comicsalternative.com. Well, until next time, I'm Gwen. And I'm Derek. Take care.